Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Isaiah. Of course, as you would recognize, there's a lot about Isaiah himself as well. This is lesson number eight in that series for February 20 of 2021, and the focus in this lesson is on Isaiah 40. And we're going to see that Isaiah 40 is introducing us to a whole new section in the book of Isaiah and a whole new sort of different kind of wording and different approach to a lot of things. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of following your words and your actions as you dealt with these people who lived so long ago. We recognize that you need to speak the truth about your own reputation and about your own name and your own kingdom whenever necessary. Help us to realize that that's one of the themes in the great controversy. Can we learn how to speak the truth about you and represent you correctly to those around us? May that be the result of our discussion together this time as our prayer in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. As we mentioned, we've come to a major junction in the book of Isaiah. There are really big differences between what we've studied in Isaiah 1 through 39 and what we're going to study now, the more prophetic portions of the book starting from chapter 40 going up through 66. Isaiah 39 forms a kind of transition chapter. It talks about Hezekiah showing his wealth to the Babylonians and God telling him that through Isaiah that one day, the Babylonians would come and take all that wealth and take the people of Judah into captivity. But for the time being, the threats that had faced Judah from almost all sides were exhausted. So now I want you to think about this for a moment. If you were one of the smaller nations around in that area, and you were inclined to think, okay, we'd like to expand our territory, right after this experience we read about in Isaiah 37, with 185,000 Assyrians disappearing, would you want to try attacking Jerusalem? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I think the word about that got around pretty fast, and people said, you better leave those people alone. Okay, Jim? Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all their sins. American Bible Society, 1992. It's not clear exactly what God had in mind when he said that their time of punishment was completed. Babylon had not yet taken them into captivity. There are many answers to this question. There was the punishment administered by Assyria, the rod of God's anger, Isaiah 10, from which God delivered Judah by destroying Sennacherib's army in 701 B.C. That's in Isaiah 37. There was the punishment administered by Babylon, which would carry away goods and people from Judah because Hezekiah had displayed his wealth to the messengers from Merodach Baladan in Isaiah 39 in our standard version. And there was other, and there was the punishment administered by one of the other nations against which Isaiah wrote messages, Isaiah 14 to 23. And that's from the Bible study guide. Now, if you have been following our lessons along, you know that we pretty much skipped chapters 14 to 23. And these were statements by God of what the evils that had been, were being perpetrated by the nations around Israel and what was going to happen to them. But uh, because that's not so directly related to the story of Israel, we pretty much jumped over them in our lessons. As one illustration of the change in content, we note that Assyria, the big bully that we've been talking about, is mentioned 43 times in Isaiah 7, 17 to 38, 6. But Assyria appears only once in the rest of the prophetic section of Isaiah. So you can see the emphasis is significantly different. The difference in tone and information in these two sections is so remarkable that many scholars believe that Isaiah 40 through 66 was actually written by a second person and not by Isaiah himself. 
There are, however, very good reasons to believe that Isaiah wrote all the book named for him by himself. More interesting things about the book of Isaiah are one, just as there are 66 books in Protestant Bibles, there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. Two, there are 39 books in the Old Testament, just as there are 39 books in the four first portion of, portion of Isaiah. Three, there are 27 chapters in the second part of Isaiah, just as there are 27 books in the New Testament. So some people have said that Isaiah is a mini Bible. Of course, as you might expect, the challenge for critical scholars of the Bible in believing that Isaiah wrote all of those last chapters is that there are a number of pro prophecies, and by, by the way, you might add, there are some prophecies in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah as well. They have trouble with those too. But those, there are a number of prophecies in, those, in the last half of Isaiah which critical scholars do not believe are possible because they do not think that even God is able to predict the future. So what do you do if there's prophecies there and you can't argue about the fact that they were written at a time before they happened. Is what? that the criterion for someone to be a scholar? They need to be skeptic or be asking questions or denying? They're denying. They so said, scholars. well, and if you, if you look at most of the, 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 the commentaries written about Isaiah, there'll be Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. And some people go, divided even further and had Isaiah 3. They say it's 40 to 55, and then it's 50, I mean, 40 to 54, and 55 to 66 in, in, in the chapter, because again, that's a little bit different again. But of course, if we who don't, don't believe there's, that God is limited in his ability to foretell the future, we don't have a problem with it. The same thing with Daniel as well. Yeah, yeah. For example, see the prophecies about Cyrus mentioned in Isaiah 48, 28, 45, 1, and 45, 13. And Cyrus, how much, I mean, he came along 150 years, more or less, uh, maybe even 170 years after Isaiah. There's no question about that. That event was still almost 200 years in the future in Isaiah's day. The downfall of Babylon was predicted in Isaiah 13, 14, and 21, and that's in the first section. So, such a prophecy, of course, would be impossible if not even God could know and predict the future. We need to remember that in Isaiah 39, those emissaries from Babylonia, a distinct and downtrodden kingdom in Isaiah's day, came to Judah to visit King Hezekiah after the sundial was turned back 10 degrees. Later, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Isaiah 39, 6 and 7, A time is coming when everything in your palace, everything that your ancestors have stored up in this to this day, that would be even what King Solomon and uh, yep. King David had put yes. together, will be carried off to Babylonia. Nothing will be left. Some of your own direct descendants will be taken away and made eunuchs to serve in the palace of the king of Babylonia. And this could be Daniel. And who are these people talking about? Daniel? Daniel and his three friends, friends. Probably, friends, probably, yeah, almost certainly. But God made it very clear that there was still work to do. If the children of Israel wanted to return to God and continue to receive his blessings, they needed to do something. Jim? Isaiah 40, 3 to 8. A voice cries out, Prepare in the wilderness a road, a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Fill every valley, level every mountain. The hills will become a plain, and the rough country will be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and the whole human race will see it. The, glory, excuse me, the Lord himself has promised this. A voice cries out, Proclaim a message. What message shall I proclaim, I ask? Proclaim that all human beings are like grass. They are no longer, no longer than they wildflowers. No longer. They last no longer than wildflowers. Whether, excuse me, grass withers and flowers fade. When the Lord sends the w wind blowing over them, people are no more enduring than grass. Yes, grass withers and flowers fade. But the word of our God endures forever. 
Good News Bible. As we know very well in our day, human life is very transient. Even the lives of healthy people can be snuffed out because of accident, flooding, earthquakes, or fires. And now it's pandemics. But God had formed a covenant with his chosen people way back at Mount Sinai, promising them that he would be with them and that his word would bless them. At the time of Isaiah, God once again encouraged them to reestablish that covenant. How long was there between the days of Moses and the days of Isaiah? Seven hundred years. Seven hundred years. Unfortunately, we, lived, we, living so many centuries later, know what the children of Israel did not, re, know that the children of Israel did not reestablish their covenant with God. About 100 years later, in the days of Ezekiel, God finally abandoned Jerusalem and his temple. He departed. See Ezekiel 9 through 11. And we'll just read a few verses of that. That year is Carrie, I think. Uh, I'll take it, yeah. Ezekiel 11. I'm reading from verses 22 to 25. The living creatures began to fly, and the wheels went with them. The dazzling light of the presence of God of Israel was over them. Then the dazzling light left the city and moved to the mountains east of it. In the vision, the Spirit of God lifted me up and brought me back to the exiles in Babylonia. Then the vision faded, and I told the exiles everything that the Lord had shown me. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah, imagine how God felt giving a vision to, he to Ezekiel to go and tell the other Jews, okay, I have abandoned Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, Isaiah spoke about preparing the road for the arrival of a new king. When a king announces that he is coming, it was expected that the roads and the buildings and everything would be prepared to show off us for His Excellency. And I lived for many years in, in East Africa and for many years in the country of Tanzania. And the king, the king, the, the president of Tanzania once said, I'm sick of the smell of new paint. <laughs> <laughs> because this exactly, we're doing exactly what's talked about here. While it would have been very different, difficult to prepare a good road from Babylon back to Jerusalem through the mountains and desert, etc., what God was really talking about was repairing the breach and the rough parts in the relationship between himself and his people. The road work, quote-unquote, that God was talking about was repentance, willingness to, return away, to turn away from sin, and reestablishing a relationship to bring comfort via God's forgiveness and presence. Jeremiah spelled out that new relationship very well in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. The Lord have spoken from the Good News Bible. Okay. Have you ever wondered why it says, I will forgive their sins? That's a pretty obvious, but I will no longer remember their wrongs? I thought God's memory was perfect. Never gonna, just not going to bring it up again. Yeah. He's, he's saying, I choose not to think about it. That's basically what he's saying. I will no longer. It's not that he, he, he's, his memory has failed. He chooses not to bring it up again. I, uh, I think it's not quite... With human beings, we cannot help it, it comes back. But with yeah. God, the Creator, He can say, this one I yeah. can block. And that's what makes the difference. People say, I forgive and forget. Oh, I'll forget part. Yeah. Does not happen. So, I, I have a question. This one, Isaiah 43 to 8, that's really, uh, is, this is uh, 
John the Baptist. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Go ahead, Charles. I think it's yes, you, sir. sir. Isaiah 40, 9 through 11. Jerusalem, go up on a high mountain and proclaim the good news. Call out with a loud voice, Zion, or voice to Zion. Um, announce the good news. Speak out and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah that their God is coming. The sovereign Lord is coming to rule with power, bringing with him the people he has rescued. He will take care of his flocks like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. Good news, Bible. Wow. If the children of Israel still living in Judah had been willing to set aside their sins and return to God and, quote, prepare the road work, for his return, he would have come back. The word spoke, spoken in this passage in Isaiah would have proven an enormous blessing. Isaiah repeated them in several later passages with the same message. Isaiah 41, 27, for example, and 52, 7. But when Protestant Christians, Charles, here you go. When Protestant Christians in our day read Isaiah 43 to 5 about the preparation of a road for the Lord, they should immediately think of the work of John the Baptist. John 1, 19-23, the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem sent some priests and Levites to John to ask him, Who are you? John did not refuse to answer, but spoke out, of, out openly and clearly, saying, I am not the Messiah. Who are you then, they asked. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Why did they ask about Elijah? Do you remember? Um... Went to heaven. Yeah, but that's not why they're asking about Elijah in this case. Malachi, the very last couple of verses in the Old Testament, said, and before the uh, Messiah comes back, the, the Elijah will come. Okay. So, no, I am not, John answered. Are you the prophet, they asked. No, I am, no, he replied, and where does that come from, the prophet? Remember? Jesus was also called a prophet? Yeah, but we haven't got to Jesus yet. Well, when the, the, the Jew says, is Elijah back, come back, because Yahweh is God, isn't that what Elijah uh, uh, yeah. means? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but that's not what this comes from. Remember that Moses, way back in Deuteronomy, is giving his last message to the children of Israel, said, I will send you a prophet, prophet like myself. So that's the one they're asking about. Mm -hmm. Are you the one that was prophesied by Moses? No, he replied. Then tell us who you are, they asked. We have to take an answer back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John answered by quoting the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice of someone shouting in the desert, make a straight path for the Lord to travel. There it is, right there. But even before John proclaimed anything about Jesus, there were two older individuals living in or around Jerusalem, who, were, who prophetically saw that the baby Jesus was the Messiah. I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about the experiences of Simeon and Anna, recorded in Luke 2. So imagine yourself, you're in Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem there, and you're in the, this enlarged temple built, built up by, by Herod to, to get a name for himself, was sponsored by the Roman government, really, by, this, by Caesar, who was his friend. And so you go in the courtyard, and all of a sudden, you have been promised by God that you would someday see the Messiah. Mm. So one day you're in the temple courtyard, and here comes this very ordinary, plain-looking couple, and something in your voice somehow says to you, those people right there. And you look at them, and... <laughs> He knew the time, though. Yeah. He knew the time that... But they all should have known the time. Yeah, but then, yes, I bet he said, ah, that one there. Well, they, they, they you know, he must have come, and both of them, and of the same way. You know, could they see anything different about Jesus? Probably not. But they were willing to say, Lord, now let me die. Yeah. Wow. Well, 
um, being told by God that he was the coming Messiah, how would you have reacted? Would you have been skeptical? Would you have been amazed? I mean, well, they knew the history. They knew the prophecies. They knew um, this, the couple uh, knew, um, they studied uh, Psalms 22. Mm -hmm. They studied uh, Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. So this... But remember that all the Jews believed. What was their belief? When the spy is born, he will lead the military yes. and he will drive out the Romans and we will rule the world. That's what they knew. That's what they were taught. Okay? And here's a little baby in plain clothes, very simple, no, nothing wealthy about his parents. Now, I don't... They obviously m probably hid that those gifts they got from the Magi. Uh, but, you know, they didn't see anything special about them. But here was this baby. Wow. Of course, Mary and Joseph had been g given messages about the pregnancy and the child that had been born by that time. 33 years later, Mary Magdalene were weeping and lingering near the empty tomb, receiving that message that seemed almost impossible to her. That message came from Jesus Christ himself, saying that he was risen from the grave. She was told to go and tell the disciples, and she did. And what response did she get? She didn't believe it. While the Savior was in God's presence, receiving gifts for his church, the disciples thought upon his empty tomb and mourned and wept. The day that was a day of rejoicing in all heaven was in the was to the disciples a day of uncertainty, confusion, and perplexity. Their unbelief in the testimony of the woman gives evidence Notice of... Notice it's women, plural. Yeah. Their unbelief in the testimony of the women gives evidence of how low their faith had sunk. The news of Christ's resurrection was so different from what they had anticipated that they could not believe it. It was too good to be true, they thought. They had heard so much of the doctrines and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees that the impression made on their minds in regard to the resurrection was vague. They scarcely knew what the resurrection from the dead could mean. They were unable to take in the great subject. Ellen White, Zara Bages, page 790. Imagine that. Remember, we've, read, we've quoted many times, Luke 18, 31 to 34, and Jesus on his way up to Jerusalem on that last journey, he took his disciples aside. There with that huge crowd of people and they're all so excited because they really believed they're going to take Jesus up to Jerusalem and they're going to crown him king. Yeah. And they're all that. And Jesus takes his disciples and said, yeah, we're going up to Jerusalem. Well, what's going to happen? I'm going to be arrested. They're going to beat me, torture me, spit on me, da-da-da. And I'm going to be handed over to the Romans and I'm going to be killed. And they said, I mean, you mean after we crown you, crown you king? What are you talking about? They just didn't fit their <laughs> paradigm. Huh? Now here he is. He's he's died. That whole thing has happened, and now he's he's resurrected. And the women say, "Guess what? The tomb is empty." And Peter and John went there, and the tomb was empty. No, it's, it's something wrong. It's, it couldn't be. No, let's go fishing. Yeah, <laughs> John chapter twenty-one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, by that time, they had met Jesus. and They, yeah, they did, but even then, he says, yeah. I know, man, this was crazy. Let's go fishing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the question is, how prone are we as human beings to get into certain lines of thinking and something else comes along that doesn't fit? Yeah. Right? It just goes, well, I should go this way, in one ear and out the other, we sometimes say, don't we? Wow. Those were times of enormous rejoicing to those who could take in the truth. But the gospel is much older than any of these events or ideas. How are these presentations to the gospel now? And I should stop and interrupt here. Why are, why are we talking about the gospel all of a sudden in the lesson here? We have just mentioned the death and resurrection of Jesus. All of our Christian friends say that the gospel is what? Jesus came, he died, he paid the price, 
And now and I'm, we are free. Now we're yeah, free. There's no law. That's the gospel. Yes. Yeah. But what does the Bible say? There's an everlasting or eternal gospel. Hold on. You mean there was some kind of gospel before Jesus came and paid the price? What's that everlasting gospel? Fear God. Let me just read the, the bird to Revelation 14, yes. verse 6. Yes. Then I saw another angel flying high in the heaven with an eternal message of good news. Yes. An eternal message of good news to announce the peoples of the earth to every race, tribe, language, and nation. An eternal message of good news. What would that be? <laughs> that is the gospel. Yeah. yeah. The real good news I mean, God and is not just that someone paid our debt. The real good news is the truth about God's character his government, and how he runs his universe. It has always been true, and it always will be true. There's never a time when it wasn't true. There's never a time when it will not be true. In these verses, Isaiah began talking about a new theme. After discussing God's mercy and his love, Isaiah went on to describe God's power and the facts that separate the true God from all imitations. And, and we know about that, don't we? I mean... What's the difference between a true God and all these other things that we, and, and well, we'll talk, we're getting into it in a moment here, but imagine someone, I mean, you could take even the sun. You look up there at the sun. Well, what, what kind of benefits do we get from the sun? Well, it makes the plants grow. It warms the earth. Well, it's, well we better worship it, <laughs> right? Well, and the moon, how does it stay up there? How, why doesn't it fall down? Better worship it, right? And all the stars, we better worship those. You know, people would, would look at things and they would say, something unexplainable? Yeah. So it's unexplainable, what do you do? You worship it. Yeah. Most of the flags of the countries in this world have the sun in there. A lot of them do. Yes, no, and so many. And so many have the crescent, the moon, yes. and the sun in mm -hmm. there. And, yeah. yeah. Well, the God that we worship is the Creator. Do we understand all the implications of that? Most people don't. He can create out of nothing. nothing. Yeah. Now, I think of Einstein and his E equals MC squared. We figured out how to take hydrogen, jam it together and do certain things and make it lose a tiny little bit of its power and create the most powerful bomb that anybody's ever, anybody on this earth has ever heard about. And what does God do? He says he takes that entire power he has and he makes matter out of it. He reverses that power, that, that E equals MC squared formula. Amazing. He, he could create out of nothing. In comparison with him, human beings are nothing more than ants or blades of grass. But in this chapter, the themes of mercy and power are interwoven. Uh, we've, we've talked about Isaiah 40, 1 to 5. Think about the mercy. Let's just look at that again really quick. Comfort my people, says our Lord. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all their sins. A voice cries out, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our, from our, for our God. Fill every valley, level every mountain. The hills will become a plain and the rough country will, will be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and the whole human race will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. I want you to try to imagine yourself living in the days of Isaiah. And he's given all these predictions of terrible things that are going to happen. And he's, he's, you know, he's worked with the king and so forth like this. And now all of a sudden he's talking, oh, Everybody be happy, relax, things are going to be fine. And you think somebody came to Isaiah and said, uh, what happened to you? How come your message has all of a sudden changed so, so much? Well, the next we talk in the next section of Isaiah 40, we have power. Isaiah 43 to 8 talks about glory. It talks about permanence versus human weakness. And what is it, how does it describe humans? They're like what? Grass. Ants or blades of grass. Yeah, I'm sure, you know. We now, we now have a little feel of that. I mean, think about the, the people who went to the moon and they yeah. took that picture back and here we are, a little blue marble out there just floating in space, you know. 
and mercy again, Isaiah 49 to 11. The good news, God is going to deliver. He's going to shepherd his people. But he still has power. Isaiah 40, 12 to 26, the incomparable creator. That's his power for sure. And then mercy again in Isaiah 40, 27 to 31, as creator, he gives power to the faint. I'm going to read those verses again. Israel, why then do you complain that the Lord doesn't know your troubles or care if you suffer injustice? Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. There's the everlasting again. He created all the world. He never grows tired or weary. No one understands his thoughts. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young go weak. Young people can fall exhausted. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. Yeah, when you run a marathon, you understand about running and not getting weary. <laughs> the implication of that. Okay. Having introduced God's might in terms of his glory and permanence, that's from Isaiah 40, 3 to 8, Isaiah elaborates on his power and superior wisdom which make earth and earthlings appear puny. That's from Isaiah 40, 12 through 17. Here Isaiah's style with rhetorical questions and vivid analogies referring to the earth and its past sounds like God's answer to Job. That's from Job 38 through 41. It's out of the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay, let's think about Job for a little bit. What happens in the book of Job? The first two chapters are about events happening in heaven discussion back and forth and and God declares that Job is a faithful and upright person right he says that to the right directly to the devil twice amazing and then there starts those con those conversations between Job and his three friends and they say all kinds of nonsense and Job says I don't know why all this is happening to me and they said man there's no way all the terrible things that happened to you could happen to somebody unless they had done terrible sins. Now confess. Tell us what you've done. And on and on and on. They, they went around and around and around. And finally that young guy comes in and he says, you guys, you've just been blowing hot air. Let me tell you. And he spouts off. And then God comes. And a lot of people think that God, because God addresses Job himself. It's true. But he, he's really talking to all of them. He says, were you there when I made the world? Were you there when I set the limits on, bounds on the ocean? And da-da-da, all this kind of stuff. And I hope they were listening and they were, they were thinking a little bit. And then finally God says, okay, that's enough. Job says, oh, okay, okay I give up. And God says, don't, don't give up. You're, you, you've represented me, right? Job is the one who's told the truth about me. So, will God someday say about us that we've told the truth about him? I want you to think about that. Are you, by your life and by your speech, by what you say, do you represent God correctly every day? In those chapters, God spelled out, spelled out in detail how far superior he is to any other possible so-called God. He created our world set boundaries on the ocean, set up the mountains, created uh, and created the beasts, including the hippopotamus and the crocodile. When we have considered all of this, we must agree with Isaiah's words in Isaiah 40, 18 to 20. To whom can we be, can, can God be compared? How can you describe what he's like? He's not like an idol that workmen make, that metal workers cover with gold and sit in a base on a silver. The man who cannot afford silver or gold chooses wood that will not rot. He finds a skillful craftsman to make an image that won't fall down. Good news, <laughs> Bible. <laughs> I have to chuckle when I read it. You know. Oh, you know, dear God, help me, save me. Oh, sorry, you fell over. Let me prop you back up. <laughs> the other place it says he, he took half of it yeah. and carved it and, and warmed himself and yeah. made a meal. Yeah, cooked a meal. yeah after carving, <laughs> uh, carving the aisle, he takes yeah. the rest of it and, and cooks it, cooks his meal over it. Yeah. And Elijah, of course, had fun. 
Yeah. Now pray more. Come on, yeah. tear up. Can we beat your chest? Yeah, dancing around. Dancing the, around, the right, right. Well, clearly there's no one like our God. No one else in the universe comes even close to being able to be compared with our incomparable God. I have a friend who describes there's, there's a great divide between God is up there in a, in a group category by himself and all the rest of us and angels, us, all of us, all creatures, we're in a separate category. None of us, none of us is in his category. And yet the people are complaining as if God did not exist or that he was not aware of their problems. But isn't that how Satan wants us to picture our Heavenly Father? Yeah. How does it make you feel to recognize that the infinite God of the universe, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, able to be everywhere at one time, and omnipotent, all-powerful, wants to be your personal friend? I mean, what more could you ask for? Yeah. So Isaiah, being aware of what was going on in Judah in his day, asked the people why they had turned to idolatry. And then he began to show how foolish that was. People were trying to produce imitations of powerful forces. I mean, we, we would recognize that the sun is a powerful force. We would recognize that, you know, the moon is a powerful force. And Today we know about gravity and why things spin around other things and so forth. But think about those days. I mean, you're standing there and you're looking up and you're, okay, why isn't that thing falling on us? Yeah. You know? I mean, if you pick something out like this, you let go of it, what do you do? It drops, right? So why is the thing sitting up there and, it's, and it slowly moves across the sky high? You know, like, you know? They must have wondered. And I will tell you, it's very interesting that uh, a man in Egypt in charge of the museum in Cairo uh, noticed that there was a, a well, a deep well, a very straight up and down well, about 600 miles south of Cairo. And at a certain time in the year, the sun would shine and the light would go right straight down all the way into the bottom. And I won't go into the details, but he stuck a stick straight up in Cairo, and he says that same time when the sun is straight down into that time, it's 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 casts a shadow here, and he measured the angle of the thing. Says, you know what? Our world must our world. This was this is what 400 years before Christ or 500 years before. Our world must be about 40,000 miles. Well, it was 40,000 kilometers in diameter, in, not in diameter, in in circumference. He figured it out just about the time these guys are talking here. Amazing. Well, people are trying to produce imitations of powerful forces that they believe would bless them with crops and fertility. But idolatry, in effect, is trying to substitute a useless piece of metal or wood which could not even stand up without being supported in the place of our unique, intimate relationship with God. And you can read about that in the Second Commandment in Isaiah 42, verse 8. Let me just look at that really quickly, quick. I alone am the God, Lord your God. No other God may share my glory. I will not let idols share my praise. This turning away from the true God to idolatry is referred to in the Bible as spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. Can you think of anybody, any place in the, body where it, in the Bible where it talks about spiritual adultery? Besides, um, besides these Old Testament passages we're going to look at right now, is there any place in the New Testament where it talks about spiritual adultery? Remember reading about someone by the name of Babylon, who's a harlot? It has to be uh, yes. Second uh, John, uh, or is it Peter? 17. Revelation. 17. Revelation 17 and 18. And 19. But Revelation. Peter refers uh, yeah. uh, in 2 Peter 5 something, also Babylon. <laughs> okay, so in the, in the Old Testament we're told about spiritual adultery. Jeremiah 3, verse 6 to 9. When, I, when Josiah was king, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what Israel, that unfaithful woman, has done? 
She has turned away from me, and on every hill and under every green tree, she has acted like a prostitute. Let me stop there for a second. What does that mean? Well, that's where they did all their... They put temples. up little altars and temples and everything to these fertility cult gods everywhere. That's what it's talking about. I thought that, she, that after she had done all this, she would surely return to me. But she did not return, and her unfaithful sister Judah saw it all. Judah also saw that I divorced Israel and sent her away because she had turned from me and had become a prostitute. But Judah, Israel's unfaithful sister, was not afraid. She too became a prostitute and was not at all ashamed. She defiled the land and she committed adultery by worshiping stones and trees. Good wow. news Bible. Wow. Okay, Carrie? Okay. <clears throat> Ezekiel 16 is where I'm reading from, verses 9, 15 to 19. But you took advantage of your beauty and fame to sleep with everyone who came along. I mean, the Bible gets, you know, I heard one time people say if, if people really read their Bibles, they would, they, it would be, it would be X-rated. Yes. You used some of your clothes to decorate your places of worship, and just like a prostitute, you gave yourself to everyone. You took the silver and gold jewelry that I had given you, used it to make male images, and committed adultery with them. You took the embroidered clothes I gave you and put them on the images, and you offered to the images the olive oil and incense I had given you. I gave you food, the best flour, olive oil, and honey, but you offered it as a sacrifice to win the favor of idols. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop and think about that for a moment. We've got a few minutes. How, what's he talking about here? He's saying, okay, what, what did God bless them with? Okay. God gave them rains. God may give them the, 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 the you know, the, the best place, piece of land. Yeah, the best piece of land. And he gave them vineyards. He gave them fields with great fields of raising grain and so forth like this. And what do they do? They took these things and made sacrifices to offer to yeah. these prostitute gods. Well, they, if you take a little time, uh, look at everyone has a king, give us a king. They wanted to identify themselves with everyone. Every, they, we come to you and we bring in a lamb and we slaughter it. Uh, what's this? You know, and the blood is repugnant. Let us build something that we can bow down, that we can see and touch and feel. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I can, I can see one, one part of that. Here's what would happen. People would say, we have this God. Look at, look at our God. Isn't it nice? Where's your God? Yeah. yeah. We cannot see. Where's your God? Where? Up there? Somewhere? In the Catholic Catechism, they, you see, they have an image of Mary. Mm -hmm. They don't call it an idol. They just says it just brings us to my, uh, uh, yeah. brings it to makes us think about it. And, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's how they get around the uh, yes. Ten Commandment or the yeah. Commandment there, and the graven image. Yeah. So, what happens to people who choose to worship idols instead of the true God? Uh, Deuteronomy, is that you? Or? Yeah, I think it's mine. Okay, go. Uh, I'm reading uh, from Isaiah 41, verse 29. All these gods are useless. They can do nothing at all. Those idols are weak and powerless. And that's from the Good News Bible. And okay, this one is Charles, I believe, right? No, uh, and he's right. Go, oh, go ahead. I go Second Kings. The top. Uh, Second Kings, verses 17, 15. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they disregarded his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. That's from the Good News Bible. You know, over the years we've said it, it is the law that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. Mm-hmm. And of course, then we've also learned 
that if you have a false concept of God, which those are, but even from the pulpit, you can be taught a false concept of God or for even a, a study guide. So, and that is idolatry. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a graven image. Yeah. Well, ancient peoples believed that by worshiping these symbols of so-called powerful divine forces or beings, they would be blessed and their animals and crops would be fertile. I mean, and you could understand why, you know, if, if your very life depends on what you can grow or what your animals can produce, uh, you're going to want to, you know, get that, take every advantage you can yeah. of that. But God had made it very clear how they should relate to such things. Deuteronomy. Yes, Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 19. I, I like this. When the Lord spoke to you, from the fire in the mountain, now, this Mount Sinai. Is, let me interrupt for a second. This is Moses giving his final speech, one of his three final speeches to the children of Israel. They're, they're camped on the Moabite side of the Jordan River. The river's in flood se season. They look across that roaring river to Jericho on the other side, and this is what he says to them. When the Lord spoke to you from the... From from the fire on Mount Sinai, I guess most of them are dead. This is yeah. one, when they spoke to the forefathers. All the ones, all all the ones who are more than 20 years right, of age. Right. Only two of them left. Um, I think, right? Yeah. Only two of them are left. Caleb and Joshua. Joshua. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. You did not see any form for your own good then. Make certain that you do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at all. Whether so does this explain why God doesn't allow us to see Him? We would be making images of Him instantly. I mean, that's, that's a very, you know, that's the, and we're like that. Oh, did you see? Look! Yeah. You know? And then if you see, saw something, you'd think that that's all there is. Yeah. Because we're talking about the infinite, well, yeah. how, how he, he can't display everything. All he could do is see something in finite time, uh, uh, time and space, mm -hmm. two thousand years ago, and then he's gone. Because uh, if you saw him all the time, you would either after time you'd be uh, uh, familiarity breeds yeah. contempt. Yeah, you, you uh, think that. Uh, so. I have to make a little confession that we might have time, and uh, see if you'd want to dig in. Um, I have problems with pictures of Jesus Christ of any form. Yeah. Well, most of them because are of this not, reason. The, he was apparently not all that handsome. Yeah. We no. use that term nowadays. He, yeah. Because he well, didn't Isaiah want fifty-three. Well, yes. And you could take a, a person like Ellen White. He wants you to understand the message. Yeah. Right. Not be attracted to because uh, the. Uh, he didn't ride parents. into town on a golden, I mean, a, a gold or a white horse and. Plank one? Yeah. <laughs> <carried around. laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad because uh, I do have problems. I, yeah. I, I do. Even Nathan Green or whoever and, uh, yeah. does. You know, we just cannot describe him. Yeah. We cannot describe him. But he says, You did not do this to my list of my brethren. Mm -hmm. And he, he doesn't say, do look at me. me. He says, listen yeah. to me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. It's the words he has. Thank you. Whether man or woman, animal or bird, reptile or fish, do not be tempted to worship and serve when you see in the sky the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Lord your God has given these to all other peoples for them to worship. Good now we must, uh, <laughs> that must put us at some kind of Oh, huh? What are you talking about here? And what we need to realize here is that in the days of Moses, back in those days, they lived in a monotheist, monotheistic culture as far as the Jews were concerned. So what did that mean? That meant that anything that you couldn't explain, mm -hmm. God must be responsible. So why are these people over here worshiping those things? Well, that must be what God told them to do. Why are these people worship? Well, God must have told them to. So it doesn't mean that it's really true. It's just that's what they thought was true. Surely anyone who has experienced even the early stages of a relationship with the true God and realizes his potential would turn away from any kind of idol. That seems so logical. 
Well, what, what do we learn from history? Uh, many who bear the name of Christians are serving other gods besides the Lord. Our Creator demands our supreme devotion and our first allegiance. Why is that? It, well, uh, Exodus 20. Yeah. You, if you worship other gods, you're going to get the wrong message and mm -hmm. get off on it. You, you destroy yourself yeah, by self turning away from... It's self-destructive. Yeah. Anything which tends to abate our love for God or to interfere with the service to Him becomes thereby an idol. Signs mm -hmm. of the Times, January 26, 1882. Jim? Multitude, excuse me, multitudes have a wrong conception of God and His attributes and are truly serving a false God as were the worshippers of Baal. Wow. Many even... Hold on yeah. just a minute. A false conception, a wrong conception of God? How could that happen? That's idolatry. Just as well, what, we're, what did we say? We, we quoted uh, Richard Nice over the years. Mm -hmm. if, we ha if we worship the same picture of God this year that we had last year, we have a graven image. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the point is, stop and think about it. What we worship, every one of us, is the picture of God that we have developed in our brains. If that picture is not improving and growing every year, every month, every day, then we're, 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 we're I mean, even our very best conception of God is, is far from adequate. Anyway, go ahead. Many even of those who claim to be Christians have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus, they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 177. Carrie? Seeing the failure of his efforts to crush out the truth by persecution, Satan has again resorted to the plan of compromise, which led to the great apostasy and the formation of the Church of Rome. He had induced Christians to ally themselves not now with pagans, but with those who, by their devotion to the things of this world, had proved themselves to be as truly idolaters as were the worshippers of graven images. And the results of this union were no less pernicious now than in former ages. Pride and extravagance were fostered under the guise of religion and the churches became corrupted. Satan continued to pervert the doctrines of the Bible and the traditions that were to ruin millions were taking deep root. The church was upholding and defending these traditions instead of contending for, quote, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, unquote. It's from Jude 3. Thus were degraded the principles for which the reformers had done and suffered so much. It's from Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy. Okay. Somehow people came to believe that they could improve their situation by worshipping those useless items. It was a kind of self-help religion. Could anything like this affect us in our day? Don't we have a correct picture of God? Are we worshipping a false picture of God? Are we depending upon our, uh, our jobs, our homes, our vehicles, or our retirement plans to support us? Or are we returning to the true God? In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was dark through misapprehension of God. Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their creator as the author of sin and suffering and death. Those whom he had thus deceived imagined that God was hard and exacting. I can hear uh, yeah. uh, Ken Hart and uh, <laughs> Maxwell, <laughs> yeah. Graham Maxwell. God is not a kind of God his friend Satan has accused him to be. Yeah. They regarded him as watching to denounce and condemn, unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there was a legal excuse for, for not helping him. The law of love by which heaven is ruled had been misrepresented by the Arc deceiver as the restriction upon man's happiness, burdensome yoke from which 
they should be glad to escape. He declares that its precious its precepts. precepts could not be obeyed and that the penalties of transgression were bestowed arbitrarily. Okay. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings. Yeah, who's the one that's arbitrary? Satan. The arch deceiver. Who's the one that does all these, all these accusations he makes against God? He's describing his own character. And he's trying to make us believe that the Father, God of heaven, is, is really like what he is really like. Recognize the transience of human life. Shouldn't we want to turn to something much more permanent like the Word of God? God promises to come back and raise to life those who've been faithful to him. And of course, there are many verses in the Bible about that, as we know. Job 19, Daniel 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. And answer those who believe that the second portion of Isaiah, starting from chapter 40, could not possibly have been written by the same prophet who wrote the first 90, 39 chapters, it is notable that Isaiah, just as the other pre-exilic prophets did, delivered a message in which a double aspect emerges. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, there are messages of judgment, and on the other hand, there are messages of salvation and comfort in every one of those Old Testament prophets. God has promised to deal with all of our problems if we remain faithful to Him. Are we ready for Him to come back? Does this, does this chapter in Isaiah have any words of wisdom for us? Are we preparing His way? In our day, God is just waiting for us to spread the gospel to all parts of the world so that everyone has an opportunity to make an intelligent decision about whether or not they want to follow Him. Does it ever seem to us like God is not there when we need Him? Do we feel like we are crying in the wilderness? Do we have any questions about God's ability to forgive our sins? Are we prepared for that glorious day when Jesus Christ will appear accompanied by millions of angels to take His faithful people back to heaven? And I have, based on this quotation and other passages, said to people, if you want to know if it's the true Messiah that's appeared, all you have to do is look up. When the real Messiah shows up, the entire sky will be full of bright shining angels. No faking, no, well, is he out in the desert or where is he? No, none of that sort of stuff. The real Messiah comes with all the angels. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these promises, these glorious visions given many, many years before you came the first time. We thank, we're thankful for the work you did with Isaiah, even the work you did with Hezekiah and all that that meant. Now as we begin studying the second part of Isaiah and realizing that uh, you're going to give us lots of comfort for the future and lots of truth about your first coming, may we absorb it and digest it and make it a part of our thinking is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.